um, we kind of move from this system where the land is kind of in collective and communal use a lot of the time, where it's a sort of what, what happens on the on the open field system is something that's negotiated amongst the community. to something where kind of one landowner rules the roost and gets to dictate what happens on that land. And then the right to sort of pass through the landscape as well gets lost with that too. So, you know, all these hedgerows, if you go to to see the English landscape today, it's this kind of, you know, grid system essentially of, you know, thousands and thousands of fields um, with kind of hedgerows boundarying them. And occasionally footpaths will cross through them, but many don't. So that the countryside becomes a sort of, yeah, kind of a kind of closed off environment essentially. And that, that latent connection that people had with their environment was broken. Welcome to the Mongabay Newscast. I'm your co-host, Mike DiGirolamo. And I'm your co-host, Rachel Donald. Bring you weekly conversations with experts, authors, scientists, and activists working on the front lines of conservation, shining a light on some of the most pressing issues facing our planet, and holding people in power to account. This podcast is edited on Gadigal land. Today's guest on the newscast is John Moses an organizer for the UK-based campaign group Right to Roam, which advocates for freedom to roam laws and rights in England. Moses is also the co-editor, along with Nick Hayes, of the book Wild Service, Why Nature Needs You, available from Bloomsbury, which calls for humanity to reconnect with and restore land by undoing the damage of exclusionary land ownership. In this conversation, Moses speaks with co-host Rachel Donald about the Right to Roam movement, how the increase of the prioritization of private land ownership or enclosure in England broke a once common connection and right to the land, eventually relegating the public to the only 8% of land access they have today in the nation. Notably, Donald and Moses discuss what life and connection with nature is like in countries and territories where these fundamental rights are established and how England, the people in it, and nature itself could benefit from the re-establishment of these rights. John, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you here with us today. Thanks, Rachel. Good to be here. The story that you've come to discuss, and the campaign that you've come to discuss, and even sort of the history and politics that you've come to discuss today is just incredible. And we've had a couple of episodes fairly recently on the show about this connection to land and culture and a people and indigeneity and trying to bring indigeneity home, I think, as well to these places that are historically, and especially in recent history, thought of like colonizing places. So before we get, I'm like, just to say, I'm very excited to speak to you, but before we get into all of that, maybe we could begin with you explaining how is it that human health is connected to natural health? And what have we lost, essentially, with this loss of the natural world? Yeah, I think you can answer that in all kinds of ways. The, the sort of, I guess, the more kind of empirical scientific studies that, you know, more and more of those come out every day at the moment that show time spent in the outdoors, time spent in nature kind of heals us, essentially. I mean, it, it's it's good for our immune systems. It's good for our kind of psycho, psychological well-being. And, you know, there's all the kind of well-noted recreational, physical health benefits and so on. But I, I think with the campaign that, that we run, we're sort of pushing a little bit beyond just the kind of the more humdrum, I guess, like physical and mental health benefits. And I think it's, for me, it's about these kind of deeper senses of connection to the world. And I think they, they have a kind of health benefit, but it's a sort of more, more almost your kind of spiritual health as much as your kind of mental and physical health in, in many ways. I think that, that connection and sense of kind of imbrication in the world around you, you know, I think, I think that kind of like touches us on a, on a deeper level that I think responds to a lot of the alienation that, that many of us feel in our day-to-day lives. So yeah, I think there's kind of multiple layers to where kind of physical and mental health come into nature. There's been a deep rupture, hasn't there, uh, in modern society, probably industrialized society, whereby, you know, over the course of a very short period of time, we've gone from being a keystone or a critical species as a member of an ecosystem to thinking that we are somehow apart and that ecosystem health necessitates that humans be far away. And so maybe you can keep speaking to that because certainly in, in your chapter in the book, Wild Service, I was really astonished to read you know these little things of like how we have this sort of natural capacity to gauge the health of an ecosystem just by looking mm. at it. Yeah. No, I think, you know, for, for most of our species existence, we've been evolved to be in the landscape, to read the natural world, to kind of like perceive its patterns, 
you know, I, I was on a, a course a little while ago where I basically became a sort of Mesolithic hunter gatherer for, for a week, pretty much. And it was amazing actually how quickly you fell into the sort of natural modes of that way of life of kind of tracking things, of foraging things, of kind of like creating culture almost organically around the fire each day that was kind of evolving out of the stuff that you were doing together with a small band of people. And it, it kind of dawned on me that, uh, oh yeah, I'm kind of like, uh, uh, what I'm doing now, which feels completely abnormal actually in my day-to-day -day life, is the norm. That is kind of how my body is supposed to be kind of responding to these environments. And it's actually my quote-unquote normal life that's the kind of strange life, the alienated life. And uh, that kind of was a bit of a penny drop moment, I think. <laughs> so, you know, we, as, as you say, the, the period of history that has kind of seen us separated from nature, I mean, it's really quite small. You know, we're talking probably you know, a, a few hundred years really where we've moved in a kind of completely different direction. And I think, yeah, every time I spend kind of really deep and proper time in the natural world, I think that that lesson comes home to me. So I, I think we're, we're kind of born into that rupture and we don't really kind of perceive it. And yet it's kind of like completely dominates our lives. Mm, that's interesting, isn't it? Born into a rupture. It's a really nice way of putting it. Let's talk about what happened then a couple of hundred years ago. The, uh, the enclosure of the commons as we know it in the United Kingdom and I would assume, you know, in places all over the world. Could you walk us through essentially what the life of a person might have looked like then, a commoner living on the commons, and then how that life was essentially taken from them by landed forces? So commoners were people who didn't necessarily own land but they had kind of rights to use it in all kinds of ways so they, they have all these kind of quite funky names like uh, the right of estivers and the right of panage which is to like collect firewood or to let your kind of pigs uh, truffle in and get the the beech mast from the woods um so these were kind of like common rights and they they functioned almost as a kind of like you know sort of pre-modern social security if you want to put it that way so you know a lot of kind of people who are widowed for instance might have rights to kind of take their their cow onto the common uh, and graze it, you know, people would keep kind of geese out on the common, you had certain rights of forage, um, what was there from the natural world. Uh, and then basically in the enclosures, all those common rights get kind of removed from the land uh, and the kind of open field system, which was how most agriculture worked in that time. So you had kind of strips of, of land that you had kind of had rights to, to farm and use. Um, all those got kind of consolidated in one place, given to one landowner and a big kind of hedge uh, with lots of spiky things in it, sort of put around the side and, and a big kind of private property keep out sign slapped down. So um, we kind of move from this system where the land is kind of in collective and communal use a lot of the time, where it's a sort of what, what happens on the, on the open field system is something that's negotiated amongst the community. to something where kind of one landowner rules the roost and gets to dictate what happens on that land. And then the right to sort of pass through the landscape as well gets lost with that too. So, you know, all these hedgerows, if you go to to see the English landscape today, it's this kind of, you know, grid system essentially of, you know, thousands and thousands of fields um, with kind of hedgerows boundarying them and occasionally footpaths will cross through them, but many don't. So that the countryside becomes a sort of, yeah, kind of a kind of closed off environment essentially and that, that latent connection that people had with their environment was broken. In Wild Service, you've done some sort of historical research into what the landed gentry at the time were arguing for and what they were writing about with regards to the commons. Could you explain what their thinking was beyond just, you know, improve or increasing their, their private property? Why were they so desperate to reduce the rights of commoners? So they called it improvement and for them, or at least the kind of dominant narrative, and really this is the narrative that we still inherited today, I think, that what they were doing was all in the name of agricultural efficiency. So they felt that this system where you had kind of open fields being kind of discussed and, and debated uh, amongst lots of different people was highly inefficient, uh, and that it was kind of you were going to drive improvement and productivity and kind of innovation by giving one landowner a shot and, and having all their land in one place. Um, in reality, when you actually look at the kind of primary source documentation, what you see is it's less about crop yields a lot of the time, and it's more about this kind of moral crusade, essentially, against the commoners and against the people that were using the land. So that they're kind of described in the literature almost as like the commoners are like the weeds of society. I mean, they use this kind of interesting ecological terminology, um, and I, they create these kind of huge lists of all the kind of wildflowers, basically, that are in England and all the different ways that you should eradicate them. Uh, in order to drive improvement and efficiency. And they felt that these 
common right basically gave uh, people an ability to live a sort of semi-autonomous existence. You know, they didn't have to be dependent wage laborers and that meant that agricultural wages were kept quite high. Uh, and, you know, they're really kind of explicit about this in the documentation that we need to break common rights in order to create a kind of more dependent class of agricultural laborers that are reliant on a wage. And, it, you know, it's not just about the kind of wage relationships, but it's also about the kind of the, the structure of how the countryside operates because all those villagers using the open field system, you know, they all lived in the middle of the village. They all kind of were, were next door neighbors, essentially. So you had this kind of a lively social solidarity of the villages and, and in the kind of propaganda, really, of the improvers, they say, no, we need to kind of break up this system of solidarity and we need to kind of move um, these laborers into kind of isolated farmsteads, again, where they're in this kind of highly dependent relationship. So, yeah, the kind of the surface level argument was this is all about uh, crop yields and efficiency. Um, but actually, the closer you get to the source material, you realize it's about something much deeper than that. Mm, so this is about the dominance of one class over another, really sort of taking the the knees out of any possibility for a working class power base or a commoner power base, which would make them much more vulnerable to the whims and demands of the the ruling class, essentially, yeah. or would actually finally put that political class into the position of ruling class. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because the way that the commoners are sort of um, characterised, it sort of you see it really changing quite consciously depending on the political context of the time. So you know, in the 18th century. The commoners are sort of described almost as like the, the the kind of the the hardy backbone of England, and if you're going to go fight the French, you know these are the guys you kind of get into the army to do the real business sort of thing. So there was almost this kind of pride in the you know again almost like the flip side of being a weed that you've got this kind of durable, resilient sort of like um, yeah kind of recalcitrant group of people who who do your fighting for you. Uh, and then when that becomes kind of economically awkward, and there's a kind of a different ideological paradigm. All of a sudden, these guys are like feckless, wasteful. You know, wasteful. They're they're kind of like uh, useless. Oh, actually, the, this whole system's doing them more harm than good as well. You know, uh, and and so, so you can kind of see how this this particular like class, which is a sort of interesting sort of subset of the peasantry, basically, yeah, get kind of rebranded uh, as it fits the the needs and the ideology of the of the dominant classes in the time. Oh God, that's given me sort of a sense of vertigo because we've seen that playbook play out everywhere with regards to you know the the people that were sort of roped into fighting world war one world war two and then you know abandoned essentially because of their race class ethnicity yeah. Yeah. nationality and also this idea of like efficiency and improvement and even that is still being trotted around the world today as this like you know myth of development which a huge number of activists and scholars are really shouting from the rooftops now that Developing what? <laughs> yeah. This is just a yeah. bit to continue and further the development of neoliberalism, mm. not the development of peoples. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be able to explain the vast inequality that's still present today. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think it's interesting when you look at the kind of agricultural prescriptions that they uh, start putting into place after improvement. And many of them are just completely bogus, actually. And you know, all the kind of like plants that they're ripping out, like the dock plant and this kind of stuff, and that they've got these kind of like a recipe list for extermination, you know, now we realize that all of those are actually really essential in kind of agroecological models and, and a lot of the kind of the current thinking in, agri in agriculture is how you kind of integrate those plants back into uh, a system of kind of low intensive grazing and so on. So, you know, e even on their own kind of merits, even on their, their own sort of agenda, they were con completely wrong, really, in the, in the prescriptions that they were putting forward. So, yeah, as you say, kind of progress, but progress for what? And in the end, you know, progress based pretty much on a kind of lie. Yeah, absolutely. How does this fit into the other discussions around agroecology, agriculture, farming, and rights to land that we're seeing sort of, I mean, in particular, maybe in the UK, but I think are emblematic everywhere. Like labor and land are the first primary resources in any economy. And if you can grab the land and you can control the labor, then you're well on your way to putting yourself in a position of power. There are is a huge amount of sort of strife at the moment with regards to how we manage our land everywhere, like across all sectors. You know, there's strife with regards to industrial agriculture, strife with regards to agroecology, what kind of agroecology is good, you know, rewilding versus conservation. As somebody that has spent a huge amount of time out on the land and, you know, sees this as a, a, a political project as much as a, a well-being and connection project, what do you think that these debates are highlighting right now with regards to 
our relationship to the land and, and where is it exactly that we need, we need to go? So I think, you know, one of the effects of enclosure was basically to kind of precipitate the depopulation of the countryside and that's got worse and worse and worse. So, you know, the countryside in Britain now has become a more and more lonely place. You know, many, many farmers find themselves isolated, kind of farming in, in the UK has one of the highest suicide rates of any profession, you know, and that's arguably kind of tracks back to this desire to kind of keep emptying out the land, keep driving efficiency understood in a very kind of narrow mechanistic way. And, you know, the, the kind of farmsteads losing their laborers and it getting replaced with kind of, you know, mechanical, industrial approaches to agriculture. And, you know, that hasn't in the end produced a great deal of profit or well-being even for the farmers that are kind of in place. A little note here for listeners on what John just said. I'm about to cite data from the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. And while it's certainly not the United Kingdom, industrial food systems aren't unique to either country. So how are farmers making out in the United States? Well, the data is quite bleak. Total farm output, that is, the things they produce, has nearly tripled between 1948 and 2021. That's been a largely sustained trajectory. So you might think that farmers would be making more money year over year, right? Well, from the data on the USDA website, net farm income hasn't really changed all that significantly in the period from 2003 to today, even when adjusted for inflation in 2024. Farmers appear to be making roughly or nearly the same amount now as they did two decades ago, and it is also forecast to decline. To get more precise, in 2003, net farm income was about 100 billion in 2024 US dollars. And since 2003, it has fluctuated between 100 and 200 billion. And in 2024, it is projected again to be 100 billion US dollars. So, you know, I, I, basically the kind of the supermarket kind of cream off most of the benefits of that. The farmers uh, are left in, in a kind of like lonely, isolated position where most of the kind of culture that surrounds them um, doesn't really exist anymore. And I think that's kind of feeding a lot of the kind of malaise and frustration and, and kind of backlash that we're seeing in the farming community against any attempts to try to kind of change it or reverse it. You know, they're kind of stuck in a trap, essentially. So I think that there needs to be kind of rethinking, really, of what, what kind of people's place is in the landscape and how that intersects with a kind of new, new vision of farming and a new relationship between people and nature as well. Mm, definitely. Because I think right now we're, there's this sort of discussion, you might say, in the conservation, rewilding, land, you know, ecological well-being conversation, which is that now the, the human population is too big. And so the idea of reintegrating humans into the land is actually impossible because that's going to be a fundamentally unequal distribution mechanism because there's not enough land to, to go around anymore. What do you think about that? So I'm often told in the UK that, you know, the UK is this kind of incredibly densely populated place, you know, there's, there's too much pressure on the land that's there. Actually, if you look at the UK, if you go on Google Maps or whatever, I mean, there's a huge, vast amount of open green space still in this country. And, you know, I think often it's a kind of psychological feeling that people have more than a kind of actual practical mm. facts, because actually many, many people are sharing, you know, in, in England, we have about 8% of the land that's, that's publicly accessible. So everyone's kind of sharing the same like tiny percentage of it, essentially. And so it feels like we're living in this kind of like densely concentrated situation. But actually, that, that's not the reality on the ground. And I think if you can live in kind of low impact ways, actually, you'd be amazed how many people can um, be situated in the countryside without causing any ecological harm and by creating and thereby creating kind of much more vibrant and interesting rural cultures again. So, yeah, I'm kind of I'm sort of suspicious of this narrative that, it, it, you know, it's all it's all too dense and it's all too impossible. You know, we've we've gone from a place where actually the countryside was much more populated and the kind of emptiness that we perceive in it now isn't the historical norm. So, yeah, I think I think it's entirely possible. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, you, you take everyone, every single person from the city and then suddenly spread them out. But certainly there's there's a ways to rethink, I think, rural life in this country. You know, and at the moment, the kind of national parks we have in the UK, you know, that they, they don't provide protection for ecology. They also don't kind of provide any space for other ways of being in the landscape. You know, they're kept in aspic. Most of the kind of expensive villages and so on are like, you know, dominated by elderly people who have the money to afford the housing there. And most of the people that are kind of keeping the kind of old rural culture alive, you know, they're living illegally around the backs of farms and 
in caravans or kind of hidden in the woods without planning permission and stuff like that. You know, there's, there's no space made within the existing system for a kind of a rich and a vibrant culture. And the justification for that will be that people cause ecological harm. But, you know, we're looking at a kind of depopulated countryside, which is more and more ecologically depleted. So, yeah, I think, I think we need to untangle these kind of discourses that we've inherited. Yeah, interesting. Gosh, I didn't know that 8% of the land is publicly accessible in England. That is shocking because yeah. I grew up in Scotland. So we're talking right. about very different, you know, political cultures when it comes to land. We've got the right to roam in Scotland yeah. and in England. You don't. So let's talk about this right to roam campaign. How did it come about? And what are some of your favorite stories of, you know, the you know, trespassing essentially on, you know, God's green earth? Um, as if it didn't belong to everybody in that community who was working hard to protect it. Yeah, so the Right to Roam campaign was started in 2020. So the founders were a guy, a guy called Nick Hayes and, and Guy Shrevesall, and they'd just written these two books, Who Owns England and The Book of Trespass. And that was a kind of bit of a double punch that sort of put kind of land issues back on the agenda again and access in particular. So as, as you're saying, in Britain, you know, Scotland has the Right to Roam. It kind of follows a sort of effectively kind of Scandinavian model uh, of access, whereas in England and Wales, actually only a very small percentage of the land is publicly accessible. The actual right to roam or freedom to roam laws are codified into law in several nations or they are an established social norm. Some of these nations include Austria, Finland, Estonia, Scotland, Sweden, Switzerland, Czech Republic, Latvia, Lithuania, Norway, and Belarus. Specifics on each will vary, but generally it's thought of to be the right for a citizen or a visitor to the nation the right to access both private and public land for recreational purposes or even for foraging. Usually it excludes extractive activities such as logging. And in case any listeners are curious to know if you have a freedom to roam in the United States, the answer is you do not. And, uh, you know, 2020, kind of the, the pandemic was, was kind of breaking out, you know, the kind of question of access to green space and the inequality of it, I think was becoming much, much more apparent to people. And so it seemed like a right an appropriate time to yeah kick off the discussion again around access reform in this country. So yeah, I mean, basically what we, we do, I mean, we do kind of, you know, your kind of classic political lobbying for, for reform and so on, but we also organize these mass trespasses of uh, large private estates, often kind of big aristocratic parks and so on. You know, they're, they're kind of peaceful events and we use them to kind of create the sort of actors are already free and kind of uh, sort of can reconnect to the land in the ways that we would hope to use it if we had the right to roam. So we kind of bring botanists and ornithologists and people to kind of like teach people about the land and, and about nature while they're there. So I, I think one of my favourite ones was the, uh, we, ironically, under the, so there's been a conservative government in power in Britain for the last kind of 14 years and the, the minister for access to nature at some point, which is a kind of subset within the, the kind of agricultural part of government, was a baron who owned a 14,000 acre estate in West Berkshire with almost no public access to, to it, unsurprisingly. So we thought that was worth pointing out. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we organized something called the Dance of the Commons, where people kind of arrived as various kind of folk characters, I suppose, from, from the English rural past. And we did a kind of ceremony around this kind of giant oak tree in Englefields, like in front of this um, huge old manor house that this, this guy lives in. So yeah, I mean that, that that's kind of example of the sort of, the sort of work that we do, and and a lot of it as well is trying to empower kind of local groups and local people. So we teach people what their rights are in the countryside. So unlike in in the United States, for instance, trespass is only a civil offence in this country. So actually, the the law preventing you from accessing the land is relatively weak, and actually the, the barriers are more psychological. So we try and give people the psychological confidence to start responsibly exploring. Uh, and yeah, we've got kind of local groups all over the country that kind of get involved with kind of protecting and, and fighting for new access rights too. Oh, amazing. I love that. I, oh, I, I wish I could hop back in time and see that, that dance of the commons <laughs> around that big oak tree. It sounds incredible. What's the pushback from landowners? And do you have any that are like actually secretly on side? Yeah, we've got uh, a small group called the Access Friendly Farmer and Landowner Network, which is basically <laughs> sort of, yeah, kind of farmers and landowners who, they might not necessarily be kind of fully supportive of the campaign, but they're kind of up for a discussion. They're not necessarily instinctively hostile to access. So we kind of talk through all the kind of practical issues that there are around access and how it's managed. And then that kind of feeds into our policy proposals as well. So I'm not saying they're necessarily representative of, of kind of the, where kind of the major landowning bodies are at at the moment. But kind of, I think actually a lot of practically minded people, particularly farmers, when you speak to them one to the one, you know, they're not necessarily hostile to people being in the land. It's just about 
how you deal with some of the issues that they might face, whether that's things like dogs or public liability and so on. It's a slightly different picture when we get to the major kind of lobbying organizations. So there's uh, a group called the Country Land and Business Association, which is basically the, the lobby group for the major landowners. Unsurprisingly, they've lobbied against any kind of access reform pretty much their entire <laughs> existence for about 100 years mm. now. No different now either. And, and sometimes some of the major farming unions are kind of skeptical or, or suspicious as well. But yeah, I think, you know, that I think it's a practical discussion with a lot of farmers. And then I think it's, it's often a more ideological discussion with major landowners. So I think we need to kind of tease out those two things, address the practical issues and then, yeah, be, be less, yeah, kind of expose, I suppose, the, the, the kind of um, assumptions that are there in the more ideological arguments about people being in their land. It's funny though, isn't it? Because of Scotland. I mean, we've got this other example just over the border. In yeah. fact, there is no border essentially yeah. between yeah. Scotland and England almost. And it works pretty well there. There's no impact, you know, to agriculture. It's just a part of the way that we live. I don't think I've heard of any incidents essentially of, you know, trespass being an absolute catastrophe for either a local landowner or somebody working the land. And it is something that I think we as a, as a people really treasure um, and often don't realize how lucky we are. So we've got that. It's, it's right there. The next door neighbor is doing the thing yeah. and it's no problem. So what arguments really do they have against this? Well, you're absolutely right. And it's it's kind of shocking, really, that <laughs> if people still mm. you know imagine that this is all impossible when it's literally uh, happening north of us. I mean, the, the big argument that's made is that, oh, well, you know, the, the kind of land use in England is, is completely different to Scotland. Scotland's, you know, got these vast highland areas and this kind of stuff. And you think, well, it's true that there is less population density uh, in Scotland. Um, but actually, if you think about it, it's not really the density that matters, it's the distribution of people, right? So, you know, if you, if you look at where most people live in Scotland, I think about 70% of them live in the central belt, which is this kind of like mm -hmm. narrow waste of the country where all the major cities like Edinburgh and Glasgow. So actually, if it can work just on the outskirts of Glasgow, because the Land Reform Act gives you the right to access land right on the outskirts of these major cities, if it can work there, then why not on the outskirts of Leeds or the outskirts of Birmingham? You know, so actually, when you kind of really get into the assumptions at play here, it, it doesn't make any sense. But I think for a lot of people, when they hear the phrase right to roam, they imagine it's all about kind of wandering in the kind of the, the, the deep highlands and the sort of, you know, the kind of remote areas of the country, whereas actually really what the Land Reform Act did was apply roaming rights to exactly the places that were closer to where people lived um, that weren't in the kind of deep highland areas where there was always a kind of customary freedom of access anyway. You know, it is the areas that most resembled land use in England, like the lowland farming where it really kind of had its impact and, and applied. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, in, in advance of any access reform in the last hundred years, you, you know, you read in the archives, all the opponents are saying the sky's going to fall in, it's going to be the end of the world, it's going to be absolute carnage. And then of course the legislation passes and, and none of that occurs and it's completely fine. So it would be exactly the same here. I feel sort of compelled to try and paint a picture for our North American audience what roaming feels like because when you walk in Scotland I'm sure you've walked all over Scotland yep. as well you know every at some point along every fence will be a little step where you can hop over the fence and gates are never gates are always closed but they're never locked there are you know turn things you know there's so many ways to just get about cut about and it is so normal to in fact, it's not, it's beyond normal. It's just what you do. I mean, somebody can be working in their field. A farmer can be sitting in his tractor and you can just cut across his field and yell, hiya. As long as, as crops aren't past. growing. And as long as crops are growing. <laughs> Use the field margin of crops are growing. <laughs> yes. Okay, not cut across, cut, yeah. you know, the, yeah. the border <laughs> off. But, you know, yell out and say, hiya, how you doing? All right. You know, not hearing right. each other over the noise of the engine, but yeah. still it's, it's so, it's such a part of, of, our life and the idea of somebody sort of saying, you know, you can't, it's just like you can't walk through that piece of woodland because it's mine. Yeah. I mean, as a Scot, it's, it's, it's funny, as you can hear from my voice. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, it applies in all kinds of weird ways, right? So like the, the law of trespass isn't just about land. So if I go for a swim in my local river at the bottom of the hill here, technically what I'm doing is trespassing or like arguably it's, it's a sort of legal gray area, but most kind of uh, people would imagine that I'm trespassing doing that and then feel entitled to shout at me because there's no explicit statutory law protecting my right to swim in that river. So, you know, oh you, you have people doing the most gentle, normal, obvious things in the world uh, and then finding themselves kind of screamed at by landowners who feel empowered by the legislation as it currently exists. So, 
yeah, you know, as you say, in Scotland, it's it's kind of completely normal. As long as you're kind of respectful of the land, respectful of how it's being used and, and the natural world, then w- what harm in you being present in it, right? And I think this kind of idea that just the mere presence of people is in itself a kind of attack or a kind of affliction on the land or a kind of, you know, a kind of a deep and profound erosion of, of the rights of private property. I mean, that's kind of really grounded in a lot of our assumptions, I think. So, you know, it's it's almost written into the way that the kind of the, the law of private property operates that to, to kind of infringe the rights by accessing it, it's almost like an attack on the person that's doing mm-hmm. it. And I think that's why you get these kind of really like overheated exchanges between landowners and, and people who are just kind of peacefully walking through. It's because they feel like just just the presence of someone there is like an attack on the, on their person. Mm-hmm. Well, if you let, you know, one thing happen, what, are you opening the floodgates essentially yeah. to everything else? Which interestingly enough, obviously, is the kind of language that is used around asylum seekers or immigrants trying to seek refuge in, you know, places like the United States or the United Kingdom. I'm just curious as well, you know, this politics between Scotland and England is so, so different. You know, Scotland is a predominantly left-wing country, predominantly nationalist at the moment, relatively understandably with what's going on in Westminster, but predominantly left-wing. And England is sort of heavily sort of skews towards the right-wing in these rural areas that, you know, with the way that our political mapping electoral system is sort of cut up, you know, they, they hold a lot of sway. How what but and yet despite that, Scotland is the vast majority of land in Scotland is owned by five hundred landowners. So how was it that this reform got through in Scotland? So yeah, the the Land Reform Act is about kind of twenty years old, uh, twenty years old I think last year. So it was brought in in, in two thousand and three, and basically it was kind of innovation of the first Scottish Parliament. So for for listeners outside of of the UK, there was a, a kind of process of what's called devolution, and that basically brought parliaments into the other countries and that make up the United Kingdom. So Wales got a parliament, Scotland got a parliament, and it was a Labour Liberal coalition who was the the first government in Scotland there. And exactly almost because land ownership was so extreme, I think, in Scotland, that kind of provoked the need to really address and drive land reform. And then access was kind of one of the components of land reform in Scotland. And I think the kind of the arguments that were made in Scotland is that because you had these kind of customary freedoms of use of the highlands and, and access and hiking there, that actually what they were doing was kind of converting those existing freedoms into statutory rights. But as you say, really, the, the major difference and why it was possible in Scotland, I think, is that because of the dev- devolution and because you had a new Scottish parliament, it didn't have a House of Lords. So in, in Westminster, mm-hmm. in, in the kind of, you have these, this kind of two-chambered system, you have the House of Commons where the elected MPs sit, uh, and then we have this House of Lords, and people... A lot of the lords, particularly um, before it was kind of reformed, you you were basically there because you'd inherited kind of aristocratic titles most of the time. That got diluted after a bit of reforming. And, and nowadays, I think only a certain percentage of the chamber uh, are still the kind of like aristocratic hanger honors basically. But often mm-hmm. it's constituted by people who are made peers, often by the kind of the government before it leaves office, which is a highly corrupt and dubious system, by the way. Um, but anyway, there was this relationship between one of the, the chambers, the House of Lords, and owning land historically. And so although they couldn't veto legislation, they could make it very hard to progress it. And so that was always going to act as a bit of an obstacle, I think, to anything that was going to bring in land reform. Whereas in Scotland, you didn't have that obstacle. Yeah. And as you say, the, the country's kind of appetite, I suppose, for progressive reform is wider. Though I should say in England, you know, the rural vote is, is changing. It is becoming more progressive. And actually, if you poll on access specifically you'll find there's absolutely no difference in opinion in support for access rights being reformed in, in urban areas versus rural areas. You know, it's, it's identical. So there's this assumption that the kind of the rural vote is, you know, just kind of whatever the big, big farming bodies think, but actually that's increasingly a minority opinion and the vast majority of rural people want a different relationship to the land as well. Oh, interesting. And I suppose that's also reflected in their relationship towards renewable energy in which the vast, vast majority of right-wing voters in, well, in the Conservative Party, the members, uh, want to see wind and solar rolled out and less and less fossil fuels. So it does very much seem that we are living in a time where the hanger owners of the system that grew up or uh, imbibed a different story of politics, dominance, hierarchy, subordination and exploitation as that being the norm and them having the right to do that, that is very much no longer reflected at, at all across the, the populace in most countries now around the world. Yeah, and it's, in, it's interesting when you 
you know, at the moment in Britain on most issues, you'll do a poll and it'll kind of be predictably kind of split off, often by age and, and demographics. So pretty much everyone under the age of 40 will, will skew left on an issue and everyone kind of over the, over the age of 50 will go the other way. Um, but actually on, on kind of nature issues, in particular environmental issues, mm -hmm. on, on access issues, what you see is that kind of polling model doesn't hold true, actually, that there's a lot of consensus, actually, um, both between left and right and young and old. Uh, and so it offers, I think, this space of potential kind of, you know, social unification, really. Uh, and we've seen that in the UK. There's been a big scandal over the, the conditions of our, our rivers and our seas at the moment uh, because we privatised our, our water system uh, not too long ago. Uh, and, and that actually, well, four years ago. <laughs> and uh, we've been living with the impacts of that. And yeah, there's kind of, kind of well, been a scandal of kind of all these illegal sewage releases being kind of dumped into our river system and damaging the ecology of it. And that's, you know, that's caused a lot of outrage and that, that outrage skews across right across the political spectrum. So to me, I think kind of nature offers this point of potential unification in a country that at the moment feels um, very fragmented. Excellent. And I think uh, what's so exciting about it, just to bring it right back to the beginning of this conversation when you were talking about this relatively spiritual connection that being out in the world or protecting the world can generate, is that once your sense of self is widened to include other, to include the natural world, it then becomes a gateway to include everybody else as well and think about the world in a more systemic way, but not through this kind of like intellectualization necessarily, but very much through a, a morality, a, a spirit, a heart and in such a complex world, I really do think that that point of unity is the thing that we need to be sort of nurturing in everyone. Absolutely. Um, you know, I kind of, my, my spiritual practice is basically going for my morning swim in the river, <laughs> you know, kind of, <laughs> and, and just doing the, what, what Roger Deacon called the frog's eye view, you know, sort of keeping your eyes just above the water and yeah, kind of absorbing the, the kind of presence of, of other life around me. And I think that's, that's what kind of grounds me in a, in a kind of more transcendental sense of self, I think every morning. And, and once you have that kind of relationship and connection to what's around you i think kind of ecological guardianship is you know just around the corner at that point it, it will never just stop there and you know and I, th and I think that's maybe something that's a bit different about where access campaigning and the right to roam campaign in particular is versus where it was kind of like 20 30 40 years ago or, or in the last 100 years you know the, the conversation's been dominated by kind of recreation essentially so you know the right to walk or the right to kind of paddle on a canoe or the right to rock climb and all that kind of stuff you know, all of which is important and all of which I, I do, but I think it's maybe missed that kind of that deeper relationship, which is more about recreation rather than recreation. You know, the ability to kind of like rework and remake yourself in relationship to the, the natural world. And I think as a campaign, we've kind of put much more focus on that side of things and tried to move it away from this kind of more sporting, athletic, I suppose, idea of what, what the outdoors represents. Because to me, I think that was this kind of like this, this kind of ticket of permission to be allowed back into the land that you had to be sort of doing it for like athletic endeavors or something like that. <laughs> you know, so we kind of got, got removed from this deeper connection and that, that was the kind of the, the sort of commodified route back in, if you like. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to like sort of um, diminish people's kind of recreational enjoyment of, of, of the land, as I say, <laughs> I do all these things myself. But uh, yeah, I think it's important to, to have that kind of um, that wider view as well. Um, John, that was so beautiful and so testament as well to Wild Service, which is just a wonderful book, so beautifully written and filled with so much, so much knowledge and so much heart. So where can listeners go and get a copy? As the cliche goes, all, all good available uh, bookstops, uh, you know, try and try and avoid Amazon, but I think bookshop.org and hive.co.uk and all these places that support independent bookshops. Yeah, they've all, they're all hosting copies at the moment, seems to be doing quite well. So go, go check it out there. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, John. That's it. Thanks a lot. So this is a, I was really looking forward to this one. So when I heard that we were going to have this conversation with John Moses about the right to Rome, I was super excited. But before I tell you well, why I was so excited about it, what <laughs> would you think about it, Rachel? Oh, just big love. Big, big, big love. I am a big fan of people doing what makes common sense, even if it's like maybe against the rules. So trespassing, because it is the land upon which, you know, we all walk. And because, you know, if people actually don't roam through it, then it will never see human feet because it's owned by some, you know, crazy rich landlord, essentially, who had his title and heritage from his, you know, all of his great, 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 great grandfathers. Well, yeah, no, I'm a big fan. And I'm really impressed by a couple of things, like the the strategy behind the campaign, the fact that they have turned this, you know, 
sort of like very emotional, intuitive, heartfelt necessity to be out in nature into a nationwide campaign and are really sort of seeing a huge amount of success. And then also the book. I mean, I said it in the episode, but it's such a beautiful book and everybody should go out and buy it. And the fact that it was written like collectively by 12 people, I think also speaks to the nature of the campaign. So I loved speaking with John. I learned loads and I hope everybody pays attention to to what the rights of Rome law are up to. And I hope all people everywhere listening in different countries launch their own right to Rome projects. Yeah. And on that, I have some thoughts because as many listeners will probably realize, you know, right to Rome laws are not, you know, super common everywhere in the world. They're actually quite, quite rare, I've noticed. Um, And the country that I am from, the United States, definitely isn't a country that has right to Rome laws. I just want to emphasize that to (laughs) folks. So and I actually have an anecdote for you, Rachel. So this this is something I it was like one of my earliest memories spending time outside. So when I was about five or six years old, my brothers and I got together with the neighbor kids and we would go behind our house into the woods to like explore because we were just adventurous young little kids, right? And there's nothing more innocent really that you can think of than just kids, you know, exploring the forest and adventuring. And I remember we got deep into the forest and we like saw all these cool things. Like we saw the bleached bones of a, of a deer carcass. And we thought that was like oh, wow. just the most wild and amazing thing. And then all of a sudden from the corner of our eye, we saw this like shadowy figure yelling at us and just screaming at the top of his lungs. And we turned to him and it was a guy telling us that we were on private property and that we needed to leave right away. And I like... If you can just imagine for a second telling like a six year old child Mm -hmm. that they are trespassing and that they need Mm -hmm. to leave, like, Mm -hmm. just think about that. That was Mm -hmm. what happened to me in the very early 90s in suburban Cleveland, Ohio. I was in the woods and someone thought it appropriate to yell that at a kid. And so we all got scared and we like ran back to the house. And ever since then, I, I just never took it for granted that wherever I was wandering was a free place to to roam. I I grew up in a country where you really can only do that in select areas such as public parks. And the concept of being able to just explore just for the heck of it was never something that I felt like was given to me or to anyone else that I knew. It's so sad. It's such a sad story. I mean, in comparison, you know, the only stories that come out of Scotland, where I grew up, where there is the right to roam of, you know, shadowy figures in the woods, um, our kids that were convinced that they saw ghosts because nobody's going to come and yell at you and tell you that you don't have the right to be there. Mm-hmm. And I think that what it does to your psychology is really, really important. Like, how are we meant to be able to cross political divides if we can't even cross physical barriers and go to meet somebody who might be different to us? or even these like psychological barriers in our own heads, you know, (laughs) not for nothing. Good luck trying to tell me that I'm not allowed to go a place into a place or whatever. Like I will do my best if I'm convinced, especially if I'm on the hunt for a a story, an investigative story, I will do my absolute best to, to get into my place through all sorts of wily ways. And I think that the psychological barrier that I have with regards to where I am allowed to be in the world, who am I? Who I am allowed to be? My right to be in the world. It's very mm. different to people that grew up with this notion of their very sort of like material existence is pinned to the notion of private property in a sense. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's a really strange concept. The more that I think about it, I mean, back then I didn't question it, and but the older I get, the more I'm like, this is a little strange to to just to have w- wilderness or really any plot of green space, just to be locked away from the rest of humanity, it feels very strange to me. And I want to emphasize, not not everyone had the same experience as me in the, the US. I'm sure lots of people, particularly in very rural or remote areas, probably didn't have someone coming by to, to tell them that they couldn't wander around. But in like places like the suburbs or in cities, that could be more a frequent of a thing. But Anyway, I, I looked into like some of the other countries that had right to roam laws. And as you point out, Scotland has some. So does Austria. So does Norway, Belarus, the Czech Republic. It, a lot of countries do seem to have them. And it's both public 
and private property, but you can't like do anything obviously exploitative on it. Like you can't log the trees or whatever like that, but you can cross it. You can, you know, move over it to get to wherever you're going or to forage. Yeah. And you can also, you can also do things on it. Right. And I think that this is partly because we don't have these like a psychological barriers. And then also because there's just less, what am I trying to say? Like furor around private property. If you've got people crossing through, like where I grew up, you know, people were planting, you know, marijuana on the common land deep in the woods, which was fine. Like nobody was going to go and have a look for it because the idea of people being there and just doing things in it was kind of a given. It was expected. You would go and see like tree houses built by parents or by teenagers, rope swings, that kind of thing. Like there was actually so much activity on this common land. And because there was this expectation that A, it was going to happen. And Mm -hmm. then people were just sort of more relaxed about it. Whereas I think if you, you know, if you go somewhere where there isn't the right to roam and there's this sort of like organic activity, it's going to cause so much more of a, a, a psychological reaction to the person that identifies it as their private property. And thus there's going to be a much big barrier to entry as well for people to just go out and mm-hmm. develop that relationship with the land. I, I, it's, you know, I grew up with it and I'm very grateful for it. And I had, I've thought about it a little bit because, you know, I've traveled a lot around the world and I've lived in different places. So when I've brought friends to Scotland, who came from places that didn't have the right to roam and went walking with them and hopping over fences and being met with the, are we, are you sure? Are we allowed? And being like, yeah, of course, you know, (laughs) I've seen it live, you know, Yeah. but the, like the mental impact that it gives on your right to like be in a place, develop that place with you, like stand up as kind of a, a human being that is part of a community and that community also being extended to the natural world. And yeah. having like a, a common sense also of of respect. And like you don't need to privately own something to respect it. You know, like in it, like I live, come from a place where there's loads and loads and loads of common land and loads of teenagers. And like in the villages and the towns, you know, they get up to some stuff. There's There's lots of graffiti and there's trash and there's all kinds of things. But like the woods, nothing bad ever happens in the woods. People look after the woods because it's ours altogether. There's something just thinking about it that feels so like stress relieving, like it it feels (laughs) less like heavy and like anxiety inducing because I always am a little bit like on edge if I go wandering around places where I I, I don't know where I am or 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 whose land it is or whatever. Like I do get a little anxious. I'm not going to lie. And not not being able to work, not having to worry about that sounds really nice. It's great. I mean, the flip side of that is when you go to a place where there aren't those laws, you then are a little bit endangered by your right. sense of entitlement, you might say. <laughs> like having visited the United States um, and having been told by, uh, you know, my hosts, no, you can't, no, don't, no, what do you, no, <laughs> stop. You're not allowed. You have to be careful, huh? especially in a red state with lots of guns. So, it does make it, I suppose, when you come up against the other side of it, it's just quite discombobulating. Like it's very difficult to understand why there's a place that I can't go into if I don't plan on taking anything from it or doing anything bad to it, but just being in it. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. You have to be careful on the other side. Indeed. Before we do close down this conversation, I just want to make listeners aware that the book Wild Service is available in three countries currently. So that those countries would be India, Australia, and the United Kingdom. And the publisher is Bloomsbury. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. It's not available in Canada or the United States, I believe, as of this recording, though that could probably change. I'm not sure. What about an ebook? Are they selling it as an ebook? I think so. Yeah, I think you can get a like a PDF ebook of it, but you can definitely purchase it in pounds AUD in the link that I'll provide via the show notes. So uh, I would really recommend everybody going and reading it. It is so relaxing as a as a read, even though it's confronting this like really horrible history of the enclosure of the commons, the politics behind it, 
our own kind of eroded relationship with nature as part of nature. You know, it confronts these really, really difficult themes, but it is written so beautifully and with so much heart and also with such clear strategy um, from this collective of people that have taken it upon themselves to to do something well and to do it right and to in order to open up space for others. It's just, it's so beautiful. I really, everybody should go out and get a copy somehow and just enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really grateful you had this conversation with John, Rachel. It was excellent, excellent topic. Something near and dear to my heart. Yeah, well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. And like I said at the beginning, I hope it inspires everybody to go out and set up Right to Rome campaigns wherever you are. If you want to read Wild Service, Why Nature Needs You, edited by Nick Hayes and John Moses, or you want to check out the Right to Rome campaign, Links to both are provided in the show notes. As always, if you're enjoying the Manga Bay newscast or any of our podcast content, like our sister series Manga Bay Explores, and you want to help us out, we encourage you to spread the word about the work we're doing by telling a friend. Word of mouth is definitely the best way to help expand our reach, but as always, you can also support us by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Manga Bay. We are a non-profit news outlet, so even just a dollar per month really does make a difference and helps us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, go to patreon.com forward slash Mongabay to learn more and support the Mongabay newscast and all of our podcast content. You and your friends can join the listeners who have downloaded the Mongabay newscast well over half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from, or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices, just search either App Store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. But you can also read our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline just by going to mangabay.com. Or you can follow us on social media, find Manga Bay through our accounts on LinkedIn at Manga Bay News and on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Mastodon, Facebook, and TikTok, where our handle is at Manga Bay, or on YouTube at Manga Bay TV. Thank you so much, as always, for listening.